Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here for this uh, session on serolimus coated balloon expanding the scope of treatment of coronary artery disease. We know that uh, DCB, drug coated balloons, are a novel device, extremely useful in certain circumstances. For example, their role for instant restenosis has actually been proven. Their role in small vessels is extremely useful. But on the other hand, there are a variety of balloons out there. A variety. Do you know at the last count, there were 26 drug-coated balloons, majority of them placetaxel-coated balloons, a few of them serolimus-coated balloons. But their role in our recent times has been expanding as we realize, in some cases, the futility of multiple stents, large amount of metal, associated adverse events from putting in large lengths or large layers of metal, as well as the long-term worse outcomes. And therefore, interest has shifted into an increasing use of drug-coated balloon, perhaps from the thought process that not having a metal there, which is what the, the bioabsorbable scaffolds were supposed to do, what could be better than not having a metal and having an artery which, where you delivered the drug and perhaps had, uh, you know, uh, uh, therefore removed the problems which occur from metal over a period of time. So uncase the artery, as they would say. So for today's learning objectives, we're going to be understanding the use of the technology of a serolimus coated balloon, a novel serolimus coated balloon, and the scientific evidence of this novel serolimus coated balloon the magic touch from Concept Medical. We want to learn the utility of drug-coated balloons for PCI in a variety of lesion and patient subsets. And we want to understand the evidence and outcomes of this novel drug-coated balloon in real-world patients. My name is Dr. Ashok Seth from New Delhi, India, and with me is moderator, Professor Huichim Tan from Singapore. We have Dr. Bernardo Cortesi from Milan, Italy, and Dr. Chin Chi Yang from Singapore as our discussants and speakers. Remotely, our speaker is Dr. Sandeep from United Kingdom, and he's also the chat master. Over to you, Huichim. So can I invite all the audience and uh, to actively interact with our speakers here and uh, log into uh, to the website for, uh, and the apps for any questions that you may have. Could we now uh, have our first talk uh, on the serolimus coated balloon, the clinical outcomes from the Eastbourne study and beyond by Dr. Cortesi? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, it will be a quite tough task to condense all of the clinical program of this device in eight minutes, but I will try to do it. And then we can uh, pass to, you know, I know the spicy questions that uh, the anchorman and the moderator are ready to deliver about, uh, about this topic, which is DCB. But first of all, my suggestion when you have to, to, when you face a new device and you have the presentation of a new device, go and ask for the animal data. Magic Touch has very strong animal data, just this slide to show that uh, uh, in the blood, in the liver, in the kidney, after one month you cannot see any drug, which is something different from paclitaxel, but the drug is still there where you have treated the lesion that you wanted to be healed. We started back in 2016 and 17 uh, with this study. We wanted to assess the effect of this device in native vessel disease with fasico natives. And what we saw was that the late lumen loss with this device in this consecutive series of patients in the Pennant Core Lab was pretty good, 0.09 the uh, uh, small vessel disease setting is here, showing how this device was faring like best-in-class paclitaxel coated balloon and probably better than drug eluting stent in this small vessel disease setting. It was just uh, one initial proof. Then we wanted to assess if it was effective as uh, a good latest generation paclitaxel coated balloon. So this is why we run the, the SIRPAC study. It is an indirect comparison between paclitaxel coated balloon and uh, 
the Sirolimus Cote Balloon Magic Touch, 12 month clinical follow up. Uh, we enrolled 1,140 patients from these two registries. Then we did the propensity matching, 290 patients per group. And what we saw, no differences at one year in terms of clinical outcome between these two devices. But then we wanted to push the limits forward and then we designed the Eastbourne. Eastbourne is uh, a registry, is in an independent registry, not sponsorized by any company, with external validation of quality of data input. I asked Antonio Colombo to be co-chairman with me in this study and we wanted to run actually the largest study uh, uh, so far on DCB. And this is what uh, we did. We just presented at the Europe PCR this year the primary endpoint, which is TLR. Uh, and now we have presented a TCT, some sub-studies, and also here a diabetes sub-study about ISPO. So as I was mentioning, the primary endpoint is TLR at 12 months, and the total population enrolled in ISPO is 2,123 patients. Again, the largest study on DCB ever done. We included all of the type of the lesions with 55% of the patients suffering de novo and 45% ISR, a lot of patients with ACS, 45% stable angina, also 9% of patients with STEMI were included into the registry. Um, de novo, as I was mentioning, were 55%, 1,173 lesions. Obviously, ISR has a, a, a worse clinical basal characteristics in terms of diabetes, uh, patients with multivessel disease, previous MIs, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, so this is not strange, and this will reflect, as I will show you in the next slide, uh, on the outcome. The overall outcome of the overall population in terms of TLR is 5.9% at one year, but uh, as I was mentioning before, we will see the outcome at up to three years of follow-up in these patients. MACE is 9.9 .9 and the safety uh, is good with a MI rate overall 2.4 and death 2.5. But if we split the patients between ISR and de novo lesions, we can see that uh, as for paclitacid cote balloon, the rate of TLR and all of the clinical adverse events are higher in the ISR with a TLR rate of 10.5%, a little bit lower than other paclitacid coated balloon, but still high. And this uh, uh, is an important message on what we have to do to face this type of lesions. In the previous sessions, we were discussing about the importance of intravascular imaging in ISR. And this is uh, uh, the, the topic. Um, on the other hand, for de novo lesions, uh, the rate of events was very low. We had a 2% of TLR and 4.9% of MACE, all of the events have, have been adjudicated by an independent CC for this study. And then what's next? Next is Transform 1 study. In Transform 1 study, we are going to directly compare paclitaxel coated balloon versus uh, Sirolimus coated balloon magic touch in a mechanistic study. We will use OCT for the assessment of the vessel characteristics and then patients after uh, this will be randomized, and then we will see at six months the net lumen gain, which is the primary outcome of this study. Uh, we have completed recently the enrollment, and uh, hopefully in five to six months we will see the primary outcome of this study. And then we have Transform 2. Again, pushing the limits forward, we want to see and to test this device in de novo lesions versus uh, uh, best-in-class devices, which are stents currently. So Transform 2 is an international, Europe and Asia, multi-center, investigator-driven, open-label, randomized clinical trial. One-to-one, -one, direct. This is the uh, steering committee that I'm leading for this study. And the primary endpoint is TLF. So now we want uh, to see with a clinical endpoint if there is no inferiority between uh, uh, this device and uh, Zions in de novo lesion. So for this aim, we will enroll 1,400 patients. Again, hypothesizing the non-inferiority with a very, very tiny non-inferiority margin. So this is the bet that we are doing with this type of study. We also have a co-primary endpoint in terms of NACE, uh, because you know the bleeding issue is still there in this population, in our populations. And this is uh, easily the uh, flowchart of the study, native vessel disease between 2O and 3 millimeters. Okay, so a little bit larger than only small vessel disease, small and mid-sized 
vessels, I would say. So we prepare the lesion. If we prepare the lesions correctly, then we randomize the patients to magic touch or Everolimus saluting stent. These are the centers that will enter the study and that actually are recruiting patients. We are at a very, a very initial beginning phase of the study with a little bit more than 100 patients enrolled. So my conclusion, DCB are a valuable tool for the daily armamentarium that in any cath lab should be present, in my opinion. Sirolimus recently was added to Paclitaxel, coated balloons to increase the potentials of this technology. Magic Touch is a safe and effective device for the treatment of any type of coronary lesion. And all of these trials that I show you, Fasico, Native, Sirpac, and so on, are the backbone of the largest clinical program of the latest generation drug coated balloons. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Bernardo, uh, just want to ask uh, an important question uh, about this technology itself. Uh, Cerolimus has a problem of getting through the intima. Uh, the reason pachytaxel balloons are around you know, a large amount of, you know, uh, there are at least 15 different pachytaxel balloons. And that's, it crosses the barrier very easily compared to Cerolimus. Uh, what's the technology here? Uh, is there a technology or magic science around uh, this balloon of Cerolimus being able to cross the barriers into the cells? Uh, well, this is, the technology is not magic, uh, just the name, I would say. Uh, the technology, well, it took a lot of years before uh, uh, getting a, a reliable technology and an effective technology to keep Sirolimus there. Uh, as you were mentioning, Sirolimus is not like Paclitaxel. Paclitaxel is more lipophilic, so it's easier to get it through the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in this specific technology, the, there is a so-called nanolute technology, so there is a barrier around uh, uh, these uh, nanospheres right. done with Sirolimus, uh, done of uh, phospholipid. There is a phospholipid B-layer that will uh, help the, the, the drug entering the vessel wall. So, so there is a novel technology to get it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Sure. Uh, anything on the... On, on the... So, uh... Uh, So are there specific subsets of patients that will benefit from DCB vis-a-vis -vis, uh, DES? Uh, well, for a, a beginning... With regard to vessel diameter degree of stenosis. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, first, first of all, I think that we should focus on the uh, clinical setting. So the high-breeding risk patient uh, is uh, a very important setting where we can use DCB. Uh, we just ran very recently a study with all of types of DCBs with the monotherapy or single antiplatelet therapy in high bleeding risk patients. And uh, I hope I will, I will be able to disclose the results very soon. Um, this is the clinical setting. On the other hand, from the lesion point of view, uh, we don't have to focalize uh, on if using a DCB or a drug routine stent at the beginning of the PCI, in my opinion. We have to prepare the lesion and then assess. If we have a good lesion preparation, I think that any type of native vessel disease lesion can be treated by means of DCB. I have a personal question myself. So when you look at your transform two uh, uh, inclusion criteria, it's diameter size of between two to three. You know, I actually run a, a registry study of one of the previous uh, Pachytaxel eluding balloon as well. And if you try to follow up this patient's clinically, many of this small vessel disease, even if they get occluded, have no symptoms. So how do we know that this is working? You know, just you know, because yeah. they may not have symptoms at all. Uh, well, you are right for the small vessel disease setting. In fact, in Eastbourne, the TLR rate is uh, so low, 2% at one year, because, okay, the device is good, but also because many patients are not symptomatic uh, anymore about that device. For, for Transform 2, we decided to push the limit a little bit further up to 3.0, because uh, I think that at least in Europe, but in Asia even more, uh, more than 50% of all the PCIs that we do, we do in patients with vessels up to 3.0. So I think that they are significant in the vast majority of the cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we would move to the next talk. And that's a real world experience, cases of magic touch with the intermediate term follow-up. Dr. Sandeep uh, from UK, he's connected remotely. Sandeep, over to you for your some fascinating cases, which I've seen earlier as well. So let's have them. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a very good morning for me. It's a program of good morning. I'm very excited. I'm honored to be part of uh, the symposium and uh, uh, 
thanks to the heritage that we set for this opportunity. So, uh, my name is Sandy Bissalabia, I'm a cardiologist in the uh, heart hospital in Birmingham, in the United Kingdom. So, my task is to uh, show you some interesting cases with the loss of people uh, of pain to the United Church. So, as we know, as we all know, the United Church is the first of its kind in the world to bloom, uh, which taken uh, in mark in 2016 in Europe. And we have been using it in the uh, UK since 2018, and uh, we are proud to be part of several trials, including the transformer trials mentioned by the now. So I would like to show the, some cases. So let's start this first case. A 64-year-old gentleman with the Christian angina. Uh, he had an inferior myocardial infarction in 2016, uh, where he had uh, two drugging stents uh, deployed, uh, 3 by 33 and 3 by 18. So obviously this time when he presented with angina, we uh, performed an angiogram, which showed some moderate disease in the LAD, but the culprit was the occlusion of the stent. Uh, which was an intra-stent CTO, as you can see in this uh, in this video. Uh, the stent is blocked right from the uh, proximal segment all the way to the uh, crux. Uh, so this was uh, opened with the combination of a Corsair microcatheter and uh, um, the uh, uh, CTO was the Gaia 3 and Confianza. After confirming the distal eye position, we performed uh, IVUS, and this case highlights why IVUS or intravascular imaging is very important in restorative occlusions. As you can appreciate, the stent was significantly undersized for the vessel. As you could see here, the stent is very small as compared to the, uh, the media to media measurement of uh, the vessel uh, size. I'll let display. <laughs> of the uh, iris, you could see the, the vessel size is quite big and the stent is uh, very, very small. So uh, with this in uh, with this information, we decided to aggressively uh, post dilate uh, you know dilate the stent. Uh, after that, we used uh, uh, IVUS again, and as you can see, this is the pre uh, uh, dilatation, and this is post uh, pre dilatation. You could see it's quite significantly different now. It's nicely expanded, and again, this is the second picture where the IVUS shows the. Uh, stents now uh, much better in terms of their expansion. So after this, we used a two uh, overlapping uh, magic touch. And this was the final result, uh, which essentially shows uh, there's no significant recoil or dissection and we're happy with the result. Patient had some moderate disease in the LAD, so he came back for an assessment six months later. And as you can see, this is the angiogram uh, performed uh, six months later. And you can see the continued good result uh, following the treatment of a uh, uh, intrastent CTO. The second case is more interesting and more dramatic. And this patient, a uh, 48 year old uh, lady with Christian angina, type 2 diabetes mellitus, strong family history of premature coronary disease, ECG, uh, so echocardiography showing anterior hypokinesia with mild limb pedal function. The angiogram on the right coronary artery, well, there was not much disease, but the left coronary, artery, as you can appreciate, it is diffusely diseased, uh, circumflex, and the LAD uh, from right from the mid segment after the diagonal, which also had some disease. Now, this is a classic indication for a DC because if you try to treat this with a stent, it will result in a full metal jacket. Uh, and a full metal jacket in a diabetic patient in small vessels, it is a recipe for restenosis, which is very difficult to treat, as Ashok alluded earlier. So we decided to treat this with uh, uh, POBA to start with. So these are some uh, aggressive balloon dilatations with NC balloons. Um, and after this, uh, we also aggressively ballooned the uh, diagonal, which needed scoring balloon. Uh, so this was the post pre dilatation. You could see the LAD is now uh, nicely open with no significant recoil or dissection. Uh, probably there's recoil in the diagonal. So we decided to go for a hybrid strategy where we treated the distal vessel with a, a long magic touch. And uh, proximally, we used a recruiting stent in the LAD and diagonal. Circumflex artery was further uh, pre dilated with an NC balloon again. And uh, this is the post pre dilatation, which again shows a very nice uh, proba result with no uh, recoil. Uh, so we again use the two overlapping DCBs here, which is magic touch. So this is the final result of uh, circumflex and LAD. Um, and patient came back uh, uh, sort of four months later because uh, she had uh, um, um, some of the lesion to assess in the right corner artery, which was only moderate. And as you can appreciate, this is uh, uh, the check angiogram done only last month, actually. So you could see uh, that the LAD is now open, probably some re mild recall in the LAD and maybe in the circumflex. So the circumflex, we did a, um, 
IFR, which was negative 0.99. So opt-in auto treat, she was asymptomatic. Um, and so these are the final uh, pictures, essentially this is post-procedure and that's a follow-up. You could see the positive remodeling of the vessel just in four months time. And I'm sure if we repeat this in a year, it will be much bigger. And we have seen this from our experience. And that's the circumflex. This is the post-procedure and that's a follow-up. Third case, similar, uh, a 78 year old man with a non established myocardial infarction with new inferior TV inversion. He had a bypass in 2015 where he had a lemur to LED and vein graft to marginal, but the RCA was not grafted. The angiogram shows the main RCA was okay, but the um, PDA was diffusely diseased. And because he had a, a myocardial infarction with ECG changes in inferior leads, we went on to treat this. Uh, and of course, here, if you want to place a stent, you probably will be using a two or two or two point two five millimeter long stent, which is not ideal uh, in a small vessel. So we balloon this, and this is the post dilatation. Again, it doesn't look great, uh, but most importantly, there is no significant recoil or a dissection. So we accepted this and used a very long uh, magic touch. Um, and then this is the uh, post uh, DCV result. Uh, as I said, again, it looked doesn't look like a stent-like result, but we have to accept these results because we have seen positive remodeling. And you will see now, this patient came back 18 months later uh, with atypical chest pain. And we did an angiogram just to understand the, uh, how the RCA looked. And you could see it's very nicely remodeled uh, as compared to what it was immediately post DCB. And if I compare the two, this is the post procedure and this is the um, follow-up at 17 months. And you could see there's a very nice positive remodeling of the vessel. Uh, do I have one more case, uh, time for one more case, Ashok? Uh, we probably don't, but I would like you to answer a few practical questions uh, because we need to be practical okay, about that's how fine. to so use I'll probably the end device. This. I'm just going to show you the, my... Uh, yeah, sure. So this is my conclusion. So DCBs are excellent alternative strategy for uh, lesions where stents are not desirable. We can avoid or we should not avoid using long metal jackets, especially in small cell diffuse disease where ISR with stents can be a nightmare to treat. And we have seen some excellent follow-up results with uh, uh, de novo lesions, unreasonable lesions uh, with magic touch. Thank you. So in practical terms, uh, how do you decide that you're just going to leave it with the DCB alone? I mean, you, obviously this is a balloon not for dilatation. This is for delivering drug. So you've now dilated yeah. a lesion, which is long lesion. What makes you decide DCB versus stenting it? So this is a very important question you ask because it's important to pre-dilate the lesions optimally before using a DCB. As you rightly point out, it's only a delivery balloon. So you should never inflate a DCB beyond a nominal. So you have to do one-to-one -one vessel sizing. So if you're taking 2.5 DCB in a 2.5 vessel, you will have to inflate only to seven or eight atmosphere. You shouldn't go beyond because you're not trying to squash the drug, uh, balloon against the wall. You just want to touch it so that the, it can deliver the drug. Um, if you have a recoil of more than 50%, or if you have a flow limiting dissection, which is a type C or more dissection, then you have to place a stent. And we call this as a bailout stenting. Even now, in the past, we used to just put a stent, uh, ignoring uh, you know, the whole length. But now we are placing stents only to seal the dissection. So for example, if I treat a long segment of LED with the DCB, like an 80 millimeter, and if there's a focal dissection and I put a very 12 or 15 millimeter stent so that I am avoiding a long layer of metal, even in bailout stenting. The second question, and again, that's sort of an interest from the audience, relates to how do you decide that you're actually going to be using a DCB up front? Uh, are there any criteria? What are the patients you feel are unequivocal, unequivocal benefit uh, has been shown for the DCB versus uh, deaths? Or are there just non-inferiority? Are they just equal? Is there a superiority at some stage? Is there a class effect of DCBs? So, you know, these are the questions which yeah. is going in everyone's mind. Sure, sure, thank you. So as of now, we have good data for restenosis as you alluded in the beginning of the symposium. Uh, and small vessel, we have data now with the basket small two, and of course, uh, Bernardo is doing the transon two, and there are data to support in small vessel where there are non-inferior stents. Superiority has not been proven yet against the stents, but we need long-term follow-up to see the superiority. 
For large vessels, we don't have data to uh, support a DCB or stent. The only time we use in large vessel is if patients have a high bleeding risk. So for example, waiting for an urgent surgery like cancer surgery, where we have used DCB in proximal LAD and left main. But otherwise, as of now, there is no data in the literature to support use of DCB or a stent in large vessel. Small vessels, bifurcation, restenotic lesions, they are ideal indications. So your small vessels mean less than 2.75 millimeters? We, we code this less than three millimeter. Okay. Uh, how long do you inflate that balloon for? Uh, how long do you keep it there? Are you just satisfied with an angiographic-like success? Do you use imaging? Those are the other questions which are being asked. Is there any sure. role of imaging in what you're doing? Sure. I mean, we use imaging uh, in almost uh, sort of 25 to 30% of our cases, not in all the cases. It's CTOs and things we use 100% imaging. Not necessarily we have to use uh, imaging for DCB, especially OCT, because more and more that you inject, you're basically propagating the dissection. So I tend to avoid, use, uh, uh, avoid using OCT in DCB, but it will help you to understand the vessel size to give a one-to-one -one dilatation, either with the pre-dilatation balloon or with the DCB. Um, second question you asked me uh, was the... Um, duration, uh, duration of inflation. The duration, of yes. So... The company recommends using two steps inflation, but I normally use for 90 seconds. Now, one thing we have to understand when you use DCBs, these are generally small vessels are well tolerated, not like left main or proximal LAD. So you can leave for 90 seconds. I tend to leave for 90 seconds. It also helps me in sealing any of the dissections longer I inflate. And even a very good point I have to make here is that even when you do a pre-dilatation uh, before the DCB, for a stent, we inflate for like a few seconds and we come down. For the DCB, I tend to inflate at least 30 seconds, even with a pre-dilatation balloon, and then use DCB. When you do a side branch, and there's increasing use of DCB in a side branch through the struts of the stent, if there's to be a, a, a provisional technique, uh, does the drug scrape off from uh, the surface yeah. as you put it through the struts uh, of the main branch stent into the side branch? That's a good point. So if you're using uh, DCB uh, or the provisional stenting, I normally use upfront DCB first in the side branch and then put the stent and I don't do any more uh, touching for that side branch. Right. However, if I use a stenting in the main branch and if the side branch goes down, then I use DCB sometimes and you can deliver DCB. A special magic touch is an excellent delivery uh, DCB as compared to any other DCB I've used. And I've not seen any scraping of, uh, I mean, you can't tell it, with, I mean, unless, you know, you do it microscopic examination, but generally it's okay, you can deliver it and you can uh, deploy after the stent. But it's ideal to do it before the provisional stenting of the left main, or the main branch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandeep. I think we're going to move on to the next talk and then perhaps just stay around because we have time yeah, at yeah, the end. Sure. We'll have more practical questions from the audience to be discussed. So Thanks, Ashok. So we now go up to the next talk, which is uh, Sterolimus Coated Balloon, Complex Case Presentations. We'll have that, uh, definitely we'll take your questions as soon as this talk finishes. Uh, case presentations in complex settings. Uh, please. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. So uh, unlike the last speaker, um, I don't have many cases with intermediate um, angiographic uh, follow-up. So I'm just gonna show you one case where, where, where I do have it, and uh, we can uh, maybe take a slightly slower pace um, um, through it. So these are my uh, relevant uh, conflicts of interest. I think this has already been mentioned earlier. I think uh, when, when it comes to uh, deciding when to use a DCB, there are a couple of things or a couple of um, categories where, you, where, where, where DCB might be more um, appropriate. I think there are lesion-related um, uh, factors, lesions such as ISR, lesions which are uh, in the small vessel, diffuse disease, sometimes in side branches, Perhaps the position of the, the lesion as well, if it's at the ostium of the circumflex and you don't want to uh, uh, disrupt the, 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 the LAD. And also, as mentioned earlier, if you have um, uh, poor or, or suboptimal lesion preparation, such as a, a case that is heavily calcified and you just cannot get your balloon to, uh, to dilate well, you might not want to uh, leave a stent behind. So those might be some of the lesion-related um, uh, situations. In terms of patient-related situations, high bleeding risk, as we mentioned a few times, um, Patients of high bleeding risk, you might not want to leave a stent behind because you are then committed to um, a, a duration um, of dual antiplatelet therapy. And also maybe in some patients where um, you might expect uh, a high risk of recurrent um, ISR, such as patients with end-stage renal disease, perhaps you know, if, you, if you can try and reduce the amount of metal in those patients, that might be a good idea. So my personal approach to DCBs is that DCBs should not 
be seen as a replacement for uh, stents, uh, not yet anyway. Um, but we should really consider DCB uh, when we expect stent results to be uh, suboptimal. So I'm just going to show you one case. This is a 56-year-old 56, 56 male. He's an ex-smoker, a diabetic, hypertensive, so all the risk factors. He was admitted for a non-ST elevation MI. Um, ECHO uh, showed EF of 35-40% uh, with mostly inferior wall um, uh, akinesia. He also had moderate CKD. Um, this was his angiogram. This is the uh, right-sided um, pictures. You can see a very tight lesion in the uh, distal RCA and also some disease uh, in the RPDA. This is the left, and uh, you can see that the circumflex is also occluded um, in the distal uh, segment. We thought that was the CTO. There were some collaterals coming in. The OM branch is also diseased. But more of interest uh, for today's talk is the, uh, the LAD. You can see that there's diffuse disease from the mid-LAD all the way down to the very distal um, apical portion of the LAD. The diagonal branch, um, uh, the major diagonal branch, um, is also um, uh, occluded um, in this uh, uh, view. So we, uh, in, uh, in view of this triple vessel disease uh, picture, we took the patient off the table, had a discussion about bypass, um, not unexpectedly, he uh, declined. And so uh, the plan was for multivessel PCI in stages because of a CKD. Um, so we treated the RCA first. This was um, uh, just a reminder of what this RCA looked like. Uh, we stented the uh, distal RCA and RPDA. This was the final result, um, not too bad. And next um, is the LAD. So how, you know, different people might uh, will obviously approach this um, uh, LED differently. You can stent perhaps the entire LED from mid all the way down to, uh, to the apex. You might choose spot stenting. Um, for the very distal LED, would you stent it? Some might balloon it. Likewise, for the diagonal, uh, once we get through, will we stent it or will we, uh, will we balloon it? So obviously because uh, of this talk, you can uh, uh, imagine that I uh, uh, did uh, ballooning for some of these uh, uh, segments. So, um, this is how, we, uh, uh, how, how I approach the case. So um, very distal um, LED, this was a 2.0. So I, I, I used um, IVUS in this case, I'm not gonna show you my images. I used IVUS, but because it was very distal, I couldn't quite get the IVUS um, all, all the way down to the, to, to the distal LED. Um, so it was, it was not possible to, 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 to assess it by IVUS um, in this situation, uh, but certainly imaging would be very useful for um, uh, optimizing your uh, DCB approach. So we, we, we ballooned this uh, very distal LED with a 2.0 balloon. Um, the angiographic appearance looked okay after that. This is a 2020 uh, magic touch. And this is the uh, immediate um, uh, appearance um, of the very distal LED um, after uh, uh, the magic touch. So the very tight stenoses have been relieved. Obviously, it still doesn't look perfect. It'll never look as good as a stent. We went on to treat the mid to distal um, uh, LED with uh, uh, stents. So this was a 2.533 in the distal um, LED and a 3.024 uh, in the mid LED. And after the two stands and the, and the DCB for the apical LEDs is what the cranial view looked like. Next up was the uh, diagonal. So the diagonal was uh, surprisingly quite difficult to get through. So we had to use um, a CTO wire with a, a microcatheter support. You can see that the lesion was very tight. This is a 2.0 balloon. Um, but we finally managed to uh, uh, crack it with a 2.0 NC at high pressure. Then we followed that up with a 2.0 25 uh, magic touch in this uh, diagonal, which at this point still looked quite small. And this is what it looked like uh, immediately after. And this was the, uh, sorry, I'll go up. All right, so this is the final result for the LED and the diagonal at the uh, index uh, procedure. So the diagonal um, TMA3 flow look quite small still at that point. Uh, the distal LED, some dissections, but uh, TMA3 flow, so we, uh, we, we accepted that. So he came back two months later for the stage PCI to his uh, circumflex. And this is what it looked like. The distal LED now perhaps looks a little bit um, uh, uh, more positively remodeled. The diagonal definitely looks better. These are just the views of the diagonal uh, side by side, so pre-PCI, immediately after uh, a PCI with the 2025, um, and then at two month follow up. Okay, so I think, I think in conclusion, um, DCBs provide a viable uh, metal-free alternative um, to, st uh, to stenting, especially in situations where you think that the stent result is going to be uh, suboptimal. 
I think, you know, obviously with, with continual improvements in DCB delivery systems, um, we can get to places where stents might not be able to get to. And uh, that, 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 that would be, you know, a, a, a one real uh, a bonus uh, uh, for using a balloon uh, approach. And of course, the newer generation DCBs that we have now with um, uh, Limus um, coating um, certainly provide a very attractive prospect. And I think uh, we look forward to uh, the results from Transform 2 um, and all the other um, uh, uh, studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, those are, that, that's a great case, uh, and actually just shows the potential of, of drug-coated balloons. But we seem to be talking about drug-coated balloons almost as a class effect uh, at the moment. It's almost like, uh, and, and we well realize, uh, new generation of stents can be talked about as class effects. I mean, whether it was EBC main or whether it's DK crush, we never actually look into which stents were used. We actually say that's the result, and it applies to most of the current generation of stents. But we seem to be talking about DCP in the same manner, Bernardo. Yeah. Are the, aren't the DCP different? Aren't they results? Are there results? Or is it just a class effect? Oh, you can do. Oh, thanks. Well, this is an important point. Um, uh, as you were mentioning before, there are 15 DCBs approved in Europe, something like 15. And out of them, only few, only few have a reliable clinical program. At that time, it was so easy to obtain the C mark that they just, just came out with 50 patients, 70 patient studies, and then they stopped doing it. Uh, some of them did studies which went uh, not, uh, not so well. So I would say a class effect that does not exist. There are some very good paclitaxel coated balloons, which are the, uh, the most studied ones. Uh, and also for sirolimus, now we have three sirolimus coated balloons out in, uh, in Europe with a, with a C mark. Uh, but uh, a class effect cannot uh, be, be, does exist, does, does not exist uh, for sure also for sirolimus because as we were mentioning before, sirolimus is so difficult to get attached to the vessel wall. So we need clinical data and immediately, not just you came out with your device and you don't do a clinical program. Thank you. The question from the audience. Uh, yeah, th thank you. This is Dr. Rajam from Bangladesh. I must give a special thanks to organizer to arranging such a wonderful session. I must, my first question is actually, how is the magic in this magic test? Though we have limited indication to use drug-coated balloon, my first question is whether the, it is the drug is the magic, or the technology is the magic, or the minimum inflation time is the magic, or the dark kinetics or slow and steady release in, in vitro is the magic. Can you answer the, uh, Dr. Barnardo? So you're, you're asking about the magic test balloon specifically. What is the magic, actually? Sure. Bernardo, where's the magic? <laughs> we, started the, we started the session with exactly that question. Let's end it with the, the results that we've seen. Where's the magic? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I agree uh, with Dr. Young saying that uh, when, uh, uh, if, if you are facing this technology, you are starting this technology, you should use it for ISR, OK? Uh, Doing imaging always, this is the limitation of Eastbourne. We did imaging only in 10% of the cases. And so we had 10% of TLR. If we do imaging always, we have three or four or 5% of TLR. I'm sure of this. And then when you do not like to put a stent, for example, uh, a very complex bifurcation, you put a stent in the left, uh, in the left main versus the LED, but you don't want to put another stent. Or if there is a big discrepancy between uh, proximal and distal part. So you just start with this. But uh, the key message is that the DCB is safe, okay? If you implant a stent uh, not in a correct way, you will have TLF, you will have thrombosis, maybe. But uh, with DCB, you may have failure, but not thrombosis. And just but, one, one more point, and, uh, and that's, it's the phospholipid uh, uh, coated serolimus, which is used in this balloon to get it effectively across across the tissue into the cells. Now that has been the real limitation of sirolimus. That's why you see huge number of packet axle balloons, and yet sirolimus is supposed could be more effective and that's what needs to be proven. So the methodology of getting it into the cells is what is novel about this, this, this balloon. So, sir, time is the best healer, but I want to know how many minimum inflation time? Minimum inflation time. You mean inflation, the minimum Mi is a minute, but the maximum I actually do if the patient's not having ischemia, I just keep it up for three minutes. It also helps to heal all the dissections that you've created. We've known for a long time that when you create dissections after balloon angioplasty, 
plastering those dissections happens with low pressure prolonged balloon inflation. So I actually put a, deb, a DCB in and uh, inflate it for up to three minutes to just heal up all the or, or seal up all the dissections. So we can conclude that we should continue at least as much as possible to release educate drug release. This Minimum of a minute. Right. Maximum is tolerated by ischemia, but beyond two to three minutes, there's no point. The drug would have eluted into the tissues. Okay, thank you all. So, Asha, I just want to share my personal perspective of uh, drug eluding balloon. I think uh, uh, I do agree that much data is required of drug eluding balloon. There are two lesions uh, subsets that perhaps uh, benefit the drug eluding balloon. One is instant stenosis and one is small vessel. We, we know from our own institutional publications that when you start putting stents in vessel size of 2.5 m below, the long-term results is poor, vis-a-vis -vis a drug eluding balloon. But one question that has not always been answered is that when you use DEB, DEB in all this comparative study, you never compare it with a POBA. You know, we actually grew up in the era of uh, balloon angioplasty and the results are pretty good as well, you know, and it's also sustainable. The question here now is for small vessel, is DEB as good as a POBA? We still haven't quite established that fact. The second lesion success, if it is a large vessel, is there a data for balloon over stent? And we know again from the trials 30 years ago called the OPUS trial, that says that even with the best balloon angioplasty results, putting a bare metal stand still gives you a better outcomes. And that's why we do away with balloon angioplasty and all went to stand in the stand mini in the 1990s. So we have not established really a comparative study of DEB versus POBA in many of these lesion subjects. Well, actually, Weichin, there is one study which was recently published by a Japanese group. It is a randomized study, POBA versus uh, uh, packet acid coated balloon, uh, showing that uh, obviously in, in POBA the, the, the native vessel disease was the setting. In POBA there was a lethal loss of 35 and in DCB point uh, something, point uh, zero something, 08, 09. Uh, and the positive remodeling was there, 10% in POBA and 65% in PCB. And there is another study which was recently presented this year, I think, with biolimus coated balloon versus POBA. So some data are coming out. Thank, thank you very much. I think we should now end the session. This has been an exciting session, a novel technology, and certainly has a role in our armamentorium of dealing with complex lesions, especially as you heard, for instant restenosis for small vessels. And let's wait for more data from, from the magic touch, because it's not a class effect, and we'd like to see what the data shows in the longer term. But it's really a promising device. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of this session.